Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to discuss uh, the kinked demand model of oligopoly. And just as some background, we really need two things. The first thing that we need to know is the difference between kind of relatively inelastic demand curves and relatively elastic demand curves. So here I have a relatively flat demand curve and th this is what we call you know, a pretty elastic curve. What this means is that when the price changes, the quantity demanded is going to change a lot in response to that price change. And this is especially compared to, say, this curve on the right hand side, which is relatively inelastic. It's a very steep. So when the price moves, uh, the quantity demanded doesn't change much at all. So our elastic curve is flatter. It's going to give us a larger change in quantity demanded given a price change, while our inelastic curve, it's going to give us a smaller change in quantity demanded as a result of a price change. The second thing that we need to know is that the marginal revenue function that's associated with straight line demand curves, well, it's going to have double the slope as demand, but the same price axis intercept. So something like this here. So marginal revenue will be twice as steep as demand. It will cut through the quantity axes exactly halfway between the quantity axes intercept and the origin. All right, so let's now turn to the model. The guy who created this model is Paul Sweezy. I've referenced the relevant article in the description below and Sweezy made the following argument. Let's take a market with very few firms in it um, selling a slightly differentiated product. So just a standard oligopoly. So maybe there are four firms. Sweezy argued that if one of the competitors increases their price, the other firms are actually not going to follow that price increase because, well, the firms are happy to take all of the demand that that firm loses as a result of increasing their price. And they themselves don't want to lose any customers, so they're not going to increase their price. So just to illustrate, if firm one increased their price, many of firm one's customers would go to the other firms, so they would lose some demand. Uh, and any of those other firms, say firm two or three or four, they're not going to increase their price they're not going to follow firm one because they're scared that they're going to lose customers as well. So if a firm increases its price, it can expect to lose quite a few customers because the other firms will not follow. To say this another way, the firm faces a fairly elastic demand if they increase their price. The quantity demanded will reduce quite a lot. Now, if a firm reduces their price, Sweezy argues, the other firms will follow them and they will also reduce their prices in fear of losing all of their customers. So if firm one decreased their price, the other firms don't want to lose their customers to firm one. So they're also going to lower their price. But this ultimately means that if firm one reduces their price, the quantity demanded uh, for firm one's products will not increase that much, if at all, because all the other firms have reduced their price as well. So there's no incentive really for the customer to, to change and go to firm one because everyone's cheaper now. Firm one doesn't get much more demand from reducing prices. To say this in another way, if the price decreases, the firm faces quite an inelastic demand demand doesn't change a lot in response to that price decrease. And this actually means that for these firms that face these conditions, there is going to be a kink in the demand curve at the prevailing market price. So let's look at a diagram to see this. Let's say that the current price and quantity that a firm is selling at will, is here at P star Q star. For prices above the market price, we said that demand is pretty elastic. It's going to be pretty flat. To say this in another way, if our firms raise the prices, they lose a lot of business because the other firms do not follow them. So I'm going to draw demand above the market price in green and pretty flat. If firms decrease their prices, they face a pretty inelastic demand. Reducing prices is not going to lead to much new business for them because if they lower their prices, everyone else will as well. So I'm going to put that part in red and I'm going to make it steeper. So the kink is at the prevailing market price. Right. 
Let's look then at what happens to marginal revenue. Let's imagine that these two demand curves were whole. So just the green one here, it would extend out like this and the associated marginal revenue curve would be like this. It has double the slope and you know the same intercept as demand. Likewise, our red part, our inelastic demand, well, if I extended it out, it would be like this. So the associated marginal revenue curve would be like this. That's just all in red. So what does the marginal revenue for our firm look like then that faces this kink demand curve? And I'll just use purple to trace it out. Well, for quantities up to Q star, the marginal revenue curve will be here. That's where our demand is elastic. For quantities after Q star, the marginal revenue curve is actually down here. That's where our demand is more inelastic. And what we get is a discontinuous section here of our marginal revenue curve at Q star. And what this actually means is that there are a range of marginal cost curves. So our marginal cost curves could be many different levels, but the profit maximizing choice would still be P star and Q star for all of those different marginal costs. And sorry, I didn't draw this diagram perfectly. You know, I should have drawn more space to show more clearly how, how much variation we could have in the marginal cost curves here. Nevertheless, there is one complication here in the reasoning because you know, marginal revenue is technically not defined at Q star and P star. We have a discontinuity. It's not like marginal revenue goes vertically down. So we can't use our usual marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost condition for profit maximization, but we can make kind of the following argument. For any of these marginal cost curves, let's just take this one. If we're at P star, Q star, and the firm raised prices, so any price above P star, so say something like here, well, at these levels, marginal revenue is above marginal cost. And so the firm has an incentive to lower their prices, increase the amount that they're producing, and take advantage of where marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. And so that's for any price above P star, the firm has an incentive to lower their price and increase their production. For any price below P star, uh, well, at these points, say something like here, our marginal cost is higher than marginal revenue, and that's definitely bad. We don't want to be producing where costs are higher than marginal revenue. So there's a, a reason to increase the price and produce less. And that's really how we get to the reasoning that P star and Q star are optimal for those ranges of different um, marginal costs, even though you know marginal revenue isn't technically defined over that region. And that's really the kicker of this model. This model predicts that over a range of various costs, the optimal price and quantity stays solid at P star Q star. And you probably know that traditional analysis of firm behavior would say that, well, we profit maximize where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So any change in costs, any change in that marginal cost is going to lead to a change in the optimal price and quantity output. Now, we do though see, however, in kind of real life, there is a tendency sometimes for prices to stay at one price despite changes in their environment, in the costs or, or in other things that's going on. And actually, we call this uh, phenomenon sticky prices. The classic case of sticky prices is wages. It's really hard to cut wages. Wages are kind of sticky downward. Um, I don't think this model is very good for explaining wages because I'm not convinced that the market for labor is typically oligopoly or that the dynamics that I described by this model happen often in like, labor market scenarios. Um, but actually, that's just but actually that is the kind of classic sticky um, price product is kind of labor. I'm sure that there is a product that has sticky prices that is kind of well explained by this model. The last thing just to think about is when we're talking about demand in this scenario, actually Sweezy calls it imagined demand. So demand curves really are, you change the price, what happens to the quantity demanded holding everything else constant. Now here, when we've thought about what's happening to demand, uh, we haven't held everything else constant because we're thinking about what the other firms are doing. 
And so this is the reason why the demand kind of in inverted commas that we're talking about here isn't really demand proper, but something else that we're talking about. Still, we can kind of get to his reasoning. Uh, But this is also why this sort of thinking has lent itself to kind of a game theoretic uh, interpretations when we're thinking about how different actors react to each other. And I suppose that gets me back to this last point is that I haven't gone through any specific uh, game theoretic interpretations of, of this model just because there are a few out there and I wasn't sure which one was useful. Um, but thank you so much to the subscriber who suggested this video to me because I hadn't looked at this model in ages and it was really fun to have a look at. Um, so if this video doesesn't answer all your questions please let me know and um, I can make something else or you can send me an email or something um, you know with a specific textbook and I can go and have a look at um, game theory applications or the specific ones that you're you're thinking about and that's it I hope that the video was useful uh, and hope you guys are keeping safe and happy